Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome back to Coral Live and now we are joined by Kevin and Rebecca who are uh, marine researchers at the University of Alabama. They're here visiting, doing some research here at the Kamabi Research Station in Curacao and we're here on the beach because these guys have been studying sand. Now you might think that that sounds a bit boring but I was absolutely amazed to see what these guys have showed me in the last couple of days and we've got some of that to show you as well. So we're going to find out a little bit more about why somebody would want to study sand and what is there in sand. It's, it's sand, right? So we're going to start off by hearing a little bit about what Kevin and Rebecca do. So um, what, firstly, what's your job title? How, how do you describe what you do? So I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alabama and I do research and teach and so I'm here conducting research on marine invertebrates. And then I'm a PhD student at the University of Alabama in his lab. So I'm still a student, I get to take classes, I get to teach and then I also get to do research. Amazing, so really varied job there. That's right, yes. we have a lot of hats we wear. And what sort of proportion of your time, maybe it's a difficult question to answer because we've already heard that there's no such thing as a typical 9 to 5 day <laughs> for a research scientist. But what sort of proportion of your year or your month, for example, would you spend teaching or in the lab or out in a beautiful place like this doing sort of collecting data or field work? In terms of the field work, not as much as we'd like. Um, we get to do maybe a couple trips like this a year, so we really try to maximize our time and spend as much time in the lab and out in the field as possible, collecting samples and things like that. Yeah, and then during the school year, obviously, we're teaching more during the fall and the spring semesters, just like a normal school schedule. Brilliant. So how long have you been here on this particular expedition? Right about one week. Yep. So in one week, we've seen a lot of really amazing animals, actually. It's flown by. But... Fantastic. Great. And how often do you come down here? This is our first time. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. But not the last. Hopefully not, no. no. Definitely not. Okay, and so, let's get into this then. You <laughs> guys study sand. Basically. Yeah, pretty much. Why? <laughs> so, if you grab a handful of sand from the sea, it doesn't look like much. But if you get it under a microscope, sand is full of animals. It's full of life. The spaces between the sand make this perfect houses for microscopic animals to live in. And so if you take the sand and you stir it up in a bucket of seawater and you let the sand settle, it looks like there's all this dirt floating in the water still. We pour that through a sieve and look at it under the microscope and all that dirt is actually animals that live in these spaces between the grains of sand. It's an incredibly diverse and complex community of life. Amazing. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a second, but let's maybe take it back a little bit and talk about what sand actually is. So we're on the beach now and you'll be able to see if I just pick up a handful now. Um, we've all seen sand. Some of you maybe haven't seen sand on a beach, but I mean, it's it's uh, obviously just a, a powder. What's this actually composed of? What is sand? So it sort of depends where you are. Sand's mm. gonna actually be made up of a lot of different things. So it can be ground up little bits of rock, mm -hmm. but it can also be ground up bits of shell. It can even be ground up bits of algae. So it really depends all over and even in the same reef you might see lots of different kinds of sand and that's one of the things when we go out and we look for sort of the perfect sand to find our animals. We're looking for a good texture and what it's actually made of. Okay, and so what is this sand that we're on now in Curacao? What's this predominantly made so of? So much of this is probably ancient ground up dead coral. Ooh. So this is the, the sort of skeletons of all the dead coral animals I think so. from the reef just offshore. Right. Amazing. Mm. And so what sort of mineral composition is this calcium yeah. carbonate? Is this That's right. Limestone? Yeah, calcium carbonate, carbonate, which is a synonym for limestone. Okay. Brilliant. So you uh, you have a handful like this, a mm -hmm. handful of sand, and you said, it, it, I mean, it just looks like white powder. I mean, you if, you, if I look really closely, I might be able to see some little tiny fragments of shells and I can maybe see, oh yes, it, I can understand that. I believe you that that's come from coral. Um, but you're telling me there's living animals in there. That's right, if you get it out of the water, it's yeah. full of living animals. So this is really important that the, the, the dry sand wouldn't have anything not really. There's it, not there's a few it. terrestrial organisms so like insects that might be hanging out yeah. on or in the sand, but it's really in the water where we yeah. see all this diversity. So just a few feet to our left, mm -hmm. where you get that sort of damp sand, and you might go for a walk on the beach and get your feet wet a little <laughs> bit. Mm -hmm. Between your toes, then the sand that's between your toes there. That's right. Full of animals. Full of animals. So 
Um, Kevin's actually very kindly filmed down the microscope some of this sand, wet sand, from, from a place just like this. Um, and we're going to show that to you so that you can see exactly what we're talking about. So, um, Kevin, can you maybe just describe what it is we're looking at in that video? Sure. So we've basically taken the sand and stirred it up in a bucket and poured it through a screen like I was describing earlier and poured it into a petri dish. And so we slowly look at the petri dish and scan across it under the microscope and try to look for all the different groups of organisms that are in the sand. And so in the sample you're looking at, we see microscopic crustaceans that are relatives of things like shrimp. We see various different types of worms, um, all sorts of different phyla or 10 major groups of marine invertebrates that live between the sand. And it's absolutely amazing, isn't it? So I saw this for the first time just a couple of days ago and I was mesmerized. How did you feel the first time? Did you know that's what you were going to see the first time you looked at a microscope full of sand? Absolutely not. So I actually saw my first sort of plate of sand under a microscope when I was in a class and one of my professors handed me a bucket of sand and he said, you know, go go scoop some of this up and look at it. And I thought he was sort of crazy. Yeah. And then you look under it and like you said, it's absolutely mesmerizing. You just can't look away because it just keeps coming to life and coming to life before your eyes. But for me, it just seemed like the, the way I could describe it was the idea of a universe because yeah. you can see layers and layers there's so many different scales and sizes mm -hmm. and colours even, although you know it's all, a lot of it is sort of black and white, but there's little pinks and browns and purples and greys in there. But there's just so much going on. It's like looking in an aquarium seeing all the big fish, but on a microscope scale. The other thing I think that I really like about looking down the microscope is because you've got the focal depth of the microscope, you get some things in focus and some not, and you can kind of, it really looks 3D, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You can really get a sense of, a bit like a universe where you see stars that are close and then you keep looking and you see some more distant stars. You almost have that sort of effect. There's some things that like to hang out near the surface, some that are trying to burrow and get back into the sand, mm -hmm. and some that are just crawling around doing their thing. So it really depends on the behavior of the organism, kind of what the plane of that uh, dish of water you're starting to see them in. And so you guys have been looking at trays of sand for a long time now. I, I was mesmerized by this the first time I saw it. You were the first time you saw it. But what about the hundredth time or the thousandth time? Do you ever get bored or do you still get that same sense that... that, that I, we I think never that's a no. <laughs> Every time we go to a new place, it's a very different community. And as you're probably not surprised to hear, there's not so many people who are doing this. And so wherever we go, we find new species. And of course, they've been there you know, for millions of years, but they don't have formal names. Um, there's still people finding entirely new groups of animals. So we do work in the Antarctic as well, for example. And recently discovered an entirely new order of animals, which is really exciting. A new order completely. That's astonishing. How often does that happen in the rest of uh, biology? Not very often. Almost never. So this is a really undiscovered world. The, the little things are often overlooked, yeah. And is it because people think, oh, it's sand, it's boring? Or is it to do with the fact that we didn't have good enough microscopes until recently? Why haven't we catalogued all these species that you can see in sand? It's a good question. I think it's just, it's a big world and there's a lot of sand out there <laughs> and people haven't looked at all of it. There's been very little work done here at Curacao, for example, even though there's a lot of people studying coral reefs and many aspects of the biology of the ocean here, but not as much work has done, been done looking at the myofauna. And so there's probably a lot to discover here too. Okay. And so we're going to look at, again at another a video. Um, that's, this time it's a stationary video and it's just showing the movement that's going on. And you can see the whole place is alive, isn't it? <laughs> So you, you mentioned there's lots of different corals, uh, lots of different species, sorry, um, in those in those fragments of coral. Um, how how many species would you get in? Let's have let's do an experiment. Let's say imagine if I got tiny little because I would have said a handful, but I saw on that slide there really wasn't very much. So if I just get a little tiny light dusting, if that were wet sand, mm -hmm. could you tell me how many roughly? Uh, individual organisms you might find in that? Doesn't well, look like much. Does individual it? organisms is going to be different than species. <laughs> sure. Um, species, I would say in one sample of sand, every single sample that I've seen here, I've seen at least 50 different species. Easily in some... different species. More than 100 in, in some samples. In nope. just some sort of really light dusting. Yep. That's astonishing. So that's the equivalent of finding a worm and a bird and a butterfly and an elephant. Yes. <laughs> Right. All in this tiny sample. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Astonishing. And then what about individual numbers that you might get? 
Oh goodness. How many animals have I got in my hand right now, would you guess? <laughs> so it, I think it really varies from place to place sure. depending on how much wave action there is, how much okay. food input there is, how protected or exposed it is. So it could be a hundred, it could be a thousand. Sometimes it's as much life as it is sand. It's really crazy. That's incredible. And it's sort of going to depend where you get it. So like you said, with wave action and everything, and that's one of the reasons we've been having so much fun here going around the coral reefs because we're able to get at these pockets of sand oh, okay. that are sort of more protected by the reef itself. And those samples, we would expect to see even more. Amazing. I feel really bad. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh dear. We were saying earlier, we were talking amongst ourselves and we were saying, anybody who's watching this is now going to be very aware next time they go walking on wet sand that you're walking on thousands and thousands of, of animals. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. Has it changed your perception of when you go to the beach? I'm not too grossed out by it, but you know, I'm, I'm glad they're there. They seem to serve an important function of breaking down nutrients and waste that comes off the reef and providing food for everything from fish to other invertebrates. So, um, but you know, we might be squishing a few when we walk down the beach, yeah. Just a few. I'm just glad that they're all small enough that none of them can bite or anything sure. like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're totally harmless, of course. Okay, and you mentioned earlier, Rebecca, about the, the, the perfect sand, the right type of sand. <laughs> so what sort of pockets would you find that you can, are you in a position now where you can see an area and say that's going to be really teeming with life and, and what yeah. sort of thing would you be looking for? So when we've been out snorkeling actually together we'll have moments where both of us are sort of swimming along and then both of us are just there, there <laughs> right there, that sounds and that's that's what we want and so usually what that is is it's going to be a little bit more coarse so a little okay. bit of a bigger sand grain and that's you can imagine it just has more room in between the sand grains for different mm -hmm. organisms to be living and then we also like it when it's really clean so not a bunch of algae and silt gumming it up we like nice clean sand and that's going to give us the best samples to look at scuba divers often do this when they see like a manta ray or a sea turtle we do this for really nice looking sand <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's awesome, man. So anybody out there who's going snorkeling or scuba diving on your next holiday, you now know to look out for some very clean, coarse sand. And that means we've got a whole city of animals yep. hiding there in those spaces. Amazing. So talk to me now then about the different species. So you mentioned a couple of names. Um, give me some names. And I'm sure we probably haven't heard of most of these things. Is there anything that we would be familiar with? So a lot of these are things that I think people really are familiar with. They're just often miniature versions of things that you already know really well. Um, so things like shrimp and various worms, like there's relatives of earthworms that live in the marine sand sediment. Um, there's, lots, there, there's lots of flavors of worms. There's nematodes or round worms. There's flatworms. There's a lot of other kind of worms that don't really even have common names. One cool thing about the sand is there's lots of groups of animals that are only tiny. And so the only place to find these, you can't go and find like a big macroscopic one, they're all microscopic. And so these worms and shrimp, so when you say shrimp, mm -hmm. they do look, and you'll see on the, on the video, they're exactly the same mm -hmm. structure as, you know, a, a prawn or, you know, <laughs> a lobster even that you might eat, big ones, but they're just microscopic. What sort of sizes are we talking about? On the order of a millimeter down yeah. to maybe one-tenth of a millimeter, some of these can be as small as, some are very, very tiny. You have to eat quite a lot of them, wouldn't you, to have a good yeah. shrimp cocktail? No. <laughs> So, uh, you mentioned as well um, about you're, you're pleased that there's nothing that can bite you, mm -hmm. no, nothing that can hurt you, but there are some unusual, strange sort of what we'd maybe call creep corner type organisms down there. Like, so what's the sort of, what are the weirdest? We know the shrimp, we know the worms, what else is there? Because there must be some really alien type species. Oh goodness, a lot of them. Um, I mean, so earlier today, for example, I was watching a flatworm eat another animal. I was watching it eat one of those little tiny, tiny shrimps. Oh. And watching a flatworm eat is a rather strange experience yeah. because their mouth is sort of down here. Okay. And so I'm watching this flatworm and they are flat and they kind of go up and lay on top <laughs> of what it is that they're trying to eat and then they start just munching on it. And it's just utterly bizarre to watch. And this is all happening in that tiny, tiny microcosmic universe that we we is beneath our feet yeah and there's um sometimes the animals will fight or they'll sort of, you know attack each other 
all yep. sorts of things going on. So we often end up with both predators and their prey in the same dish and you can observe these interactions right through the microscope. And what about weird creatures for you, Kevin? Is there any particular species that... <laughs> yeah, so, so my favorite group of animals, um, we mostly study mollusks in our labs. So we study things like snails and slugs and clams and squid and octopus, but they're... So this is, a mollusk is something that's got... Typically they have a shell, a shell, like a snail or a clam, but some have secondarily lost their shell. So like octopus, we have, we think they have an ancestor that had a shell, they've lost it. And so we study this group of microscopic mollusks that are called aplacophorans, which is Latin for without a shell. So plaque is shell, a is without. And so these are these strange shellless kind of worm-shaped mollusks that crawl around through the sand. And they have a very picky uh, diet. They only feed on dead jellyfish that die and sink to the bottom. And jellyfish have these stinging cells called nematocysts. So they have these yeah. stinging cells that can you know, you hurt you. If you get stung by a jellyfish, that's a bit like stinging nettles. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's pretty remarkable that they can eat these things. There's actually a lot of things that are able to eat corals and jellyfish with these stinging cells. But this particular species actually swallows those stinging cells. And they pass all the way through their gut and they pass them without the stinging cell firing. So it's like swallowing a loaded gun and passing it through your body unfired. That's amazing. And how, do you know how that happens? How do you do that? No one's ever really looked. And so it's something we'd love to explore in the future. So one day you might find out. Or if there's a budding sand scientist who's watching, that could be a, a mystery that they could solve in the future. Absolutely. Incredible. And what's the name of that one again? So they're called aplacophorans. And we've actually got an image of those. That's right. Um, yes. Some photos that we can show you as well. And you were saying about the, just describe the surface. Yeah, so they're, they're really weird. They're unlike most mollusks that have a shell. They're actually shellless, but they're covered with these scales that kind of act like a coat of armor to protect them from crawling through the sand and being attacked by predators and things like that. And they, they sort of have a very unusual surface, don't they? They do. So aplacophorans don't have a shell, but they have these scales covering their body that are made of the same material that a shell is, which is calcium carbonate or aragonite. And so when we're looking at them through the microscope, we're shining a light down to light everything up that we're looking at, and they act like little mirrors. And so they look like they're wearing this like coat of silver chain mail or something like that. It's really amazing. It's really, really cool. So that's your favorite. It is. Rebecca, do you have a favorite that you'd like to nominate? Oh my goodness. Um, of all of the myofaunal organisms that I've seen, I think my favorite are probably a type of worm. They're called cypunculids. They look cypunculids, or okay. they also call them peanut worms. And you can actually find these not myofaunal, so you can find them almost as big as your hand in some places. But then here, we've only seen the myofaunal kind. So they're tiny, tiny, tiny. But I think they're just very goofy looking. So they have a, a sort of trunk, if you will, sort of like an elephant trunk that flips inside out. And then when they want to feed, they sort of push this trunk all the way out and have little tiny tentacles at the end. And so that's, they're actually filter feeding from the sediment itself. And they're just very silly looking. And do you think then all these weird and wonderful shapes, is that because they exist in this completely other universe with, with spaces that they've got to learn how to kind of exist very differently than, than you and I? Is that, does that allow kind of this evolutionary burst of all different solutions? Or is it something else that's driving these, these unusual shapes? A lot of myofauna are really specialists on the habitat they live in. And so, for example, some of them are, are kind of miniature versions of things that we know really well from you know, macroscopic animals. And those that are myofaunal tend to be really streamlined, so they're long and slender. They don't have sticky outy bits, so they don't get hung up in the sand. Um, often the reproduction is specialized, so they make relatively few larger eggs. They're, they're young and have a chance of survival. Whereas a lot of marine invertebrates will lay many tiny eggs. If they're already tiny, they can't lay very tiny eggs because they'll just be sure. too small to have a shot. Of course, yeah. The eggs of a tiny... I mean, they would be... <laughs> they just wouldn't survive. Right, they'd be too small. They'd be too small. So they but, tend to lay very few uh, pretty big eggs relative to their body means size. That it's quite risky. That's very expensive for them. They're putting mm -hmm. a lot of their future in very few success yeah. uh, rates. So, And that's something that we actually see. So a lot of the myofaunal organisms actually have some degree of parental care, if you will, as well. So like we talked about these little tiny shrimp-like animal yeah. and so a lot of them will actually lay eggs and then carry them around Aww. and so you'll see them swimming by with this bright blue bundle underneath and that's their eggs and so they're keeping those nice and safe for as long as they that's can. Amazing. I, it's so interesting how it's very different than the other marine invertebrates because 
So, so their size is affecting their behaviour mm -hmm. because they're unable to just release all the eggs into the water and say, you know, well done my children, go be free, <laughs> good luck. They have to protect their young um, because there's not so many of them and they're larger and they're more vulnerable. That's amazing, it's very interesting. Okay, so we've convinced everybody that sand is phenomenally exciting to study. There's all sorts of life going on in that wet sand. Um, if anybody is watching this, maybe you know fifth grader or sixth grader, who is super interested, they've seen these images, just like you saw with your professor's bucket of sand. Um, how do you get from being a you know a teenager, high schooler, to being where you are today, a sand specialist researcher? Well, um, first and foremost, I mean you're taking science classes already and that's going to be the foundation for everything. I think that's one of the amazing things about science is all science is really interconnected. So paying really close attention in those science classes is definitely something that got me toward where I wanted to go. And then I went on to college and I got to major in biology and study more and more and learn more and more. And I think the biggest thing is to just keep that really open mind. I never in a million years, if you had told me even five years ago that you were going to spend 24 hours a day for five days just looking at sand in a microscope, <laughs> I would have told you that you were crazy. So I think just having your mind open to the fact that sometimes things will surprise you and the best part of biology is that we can just let them. So I'd say that marine biology is a really broad and integrative field. And so if you want to be a marine biologist but have other interests, it's great to really pursue those and develop those as well. Everything from computer programming, because we don't just look at the animals, but we take them back to the lab and extract their DNA and then analyze the data that we generate from those sequences. And so having computer skills is really important for this sort of thing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's been really valuable for us to have a kind of a diverse skill set so we can be good yeah. organismal biologists but also work in the molecular lab and work with the computer to analyze the data we generate. I think that's really important as well that nowadays especially you don't just have a single group where you study one subject and then you become a specialist in that subject because you know good photography skills for example uh, are very useful aren't they? And, Absolutely. And, and sort of image manipulation and that kind of thing and um, what about other skills? So you mentioned being open-minded. What about in terms of personality? What kind of person do you need to be to be a researcher? You're dealing with teaching, you're dealing with being on expedition in, in hot countries, you're dealing with 24-hour days. So is it for everybody or what sort of skills do you think um, people need or would be well suited to this sort of economy? I think definitely you have to be well organized. As you mentioned, we're doing a lot of different things. So having the ability to bounce back and forth between teaching to research to other things is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And I think definitely having sort of that meticulous eye for detail comes into play, particularly for what we're doing, right? Sure. We're talking about an eye for detail. Imagine that microscopically. So we're going through hundreds and hundreds of dishes and there might only be one animal of a certain type for you to find. And so it's really important to have your eyes there and so to that end also having that focus mm -hmm. to be able to really sit down and commit to that dish of sand or whatever it is in biology that you're looking at. It's like detective work, isn't it? You've absolutely. Got to be absolutely on the ball. Absolutely. But I would say for both of us, I think we're very passion driven and that's that's what keeps you going and so I think being able to recognize that in yourself and then harness that as the force that it really can be to kind of propel you through some of the really difficult days where it's sweaty and you're covered in sand and you really just want a hot shower yeah. but at the end of the day it's always better to get into the lab and see those animals. Well especially for you guys when you're potentially discovering whole new species <laughs> as well you you know that's definitely got to be a driver isn't it? I think curiosity is really important in this field mm -hmm. as well because it's easy to be after one particular thing and very driven to that one thing and sometimes you miss opportunities to be serendipitous and make discoveries because you overlooked something that... If you're too focused on one mm -hmm. thing you might... So actually sometimes you've got to kind of ask questions of outside of your main focus and That's say, right. oh, actually why is that there? And, what's... and sometimes it's a tangent and it was fun to explore and it doesn't pan out and other times it turns into a really exciting discovery and we find things we didn't realize were there. And, and what would you say are the, the quick summary of the best and worst? So being a bit sticky and sweaty and covered in sand, but what are, what are kind of the, the, the best and worst moments of your typical day or your typical trip? 
I mean, I think the worst moments are probably just when you're starting to sort of get tired. So again, having tenacity is so important because it might be that we go through 50 dishes before we find even one animal of maybe what we're looking for that day or even that week. And so I think that that can get really hard to kind of commit to the fact that yes, they still might be here mm -hmm. and be able to push yourself to keep looking. Wow. Um, but then the best parts are of course when you find something that you maybe have never seen before. So on this trip, I got to see a new phylum that I'd never seen before. So that's a really, really big group of animals. And I had never seen one alive, and so I got to sort of check another one off on my on my life and, list. And when you find something that you haven't seen before, there's not it's not like a book, you know, like you can have a, a book of all the birds of the UK, <laughs> and you can look it up and say, oh yeah, it's that one. Is there a does a book exist of the things that you're looking at? There's invertebrate zoology textbooks, but we just kind of have to keep track of everything ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So you should publish a book, really, of the <laughs> between your toes. It would be a really big book. <laughs> it's going to be in there. Amazing. Okay, so um, we've got somebody who's curious, who's who's very driven, very focused. Um, they like the detective work, they're studying science. Um, what are the next steps? Because everybody knows you, you know, you study science at high school and then maybe as your degree. But then, what happens when you graduate from your degree? in terms of the actual process of the roots of kind of masters and research studentships, internships, how does that process actually work? So after I finished my degree, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in marine biology and so I wanted to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking for PhD programs mm -hmm. that were in the area of interest and so I started like finding not a school that's got a famous name per se, but someone who was doing the kind of research I wanted to do and I wanted to work in their lab. Mm -hmm. And so I found a few people who were doing the kind of work that I wanted to do and just reached out to them and sent a friendly email, I've read your papers, I think your work is interesting. Um, can I check to you about opportunities in your lab and some people are like sorry my lab's full I don't have funding but other people are really enthusiastic to have someone who's excited about what they do and so Rebecca's my student and that's yep. how we met. Pretty much. Amazing. So I think we may have some students getting in touch with you in the future saying they'd like to come and be a PhD student in your lab definitely. And do you think what do you think the future is for your field? So one thing that's really exciting in our field right now in biology in general is the advances in DNA sequencing. And so the Human Genome Project costs billions of dollars, yeah. but fast forward 20 years, and now you can sequence a human genome for $1,000. Many invertebrates have even smaller genomes, and the technology is getting faster and better and cheaper. And one thing we find a lot is, well, this looks identical to some animal we found halfway across the world. And they look identical to us, but when we sequence their DNA, they're more different than humans are to chimpanzee, for example. Wow. And so it's just, we don't see the differences, but they're certainly cool. there. So you're sort of building that, that family tree or exactly. tracing it back to look at the, the origins, the evolution? That's right. So a lot of what we do is study evolution based on DNA sequence data. And in terms of geography then, um, are all the, all the organisms we find in this sand here, are they all local to here? How far do they travel? Because sand obviously can, can move quite far in the oceans, can't it? So, you know, if you've got a coral that's in, grown in Asia, for example, and then it dies and breaks down, could those creatures end up here, or is it, does it not travel that far? So traditionally people would have said, oh yeah, you have the same species all over the world. They call these cosmopolitan species. Yeah. And recently people have begun looking at this with DNA, and it turns out that even though they all look the same, if you go to different places, sometimes even very close together, you can have genetically very different species. And so these little animals are actually pretty structured, they call it. So you find lots of different species that all look very similar. Well, I suppose as well, even a few kilometers or even a few hundred meters away, for these animals is you know, it's the equivalent of, of us, you know, standing here and the other side of Europe or something, isn't it? It's a, it's a vast di distance for them to fall along. So I suppose they don't really travel and, and reproduce with each other very often from, from very far. It seems to depend a little bit, but yeah, that seems to be right. So some of them do have larvae that swim around a little bit, mm -hmm. and they can get around maybe a little bit further, but most seem to have what we call direct developing larvae. So their, their babies look like a miniature version of the adult, and not a, a free-swimming pelagic larval stage. Yeah, uh, they, they are that cute. I can't even imagine it. Already <laughs> cute and miniature animals, and even, <laughs> even more miniature baby. Incredible. So then, just finally, thinking about the future, because we've been learning when we've learned about corals and sponges and, and um, marine vertebrates and so on. Um, there's obviously a lot of threats to the ocean at the moment. Climate change and pollution and ocean acidification, all these sorts of things. Um, 
are these tiny creatures under the same threat? Are they more vulnerable or they perhaps they're more protective? What's the sort of situation, what's the future look like for, for these creatures? I think it really depends. So some of these threats that are the same for corals are going to be the same for the sand. So for example, one of the problems that we have is we're putting a lot of nutrients out into the water. We're polluting the oceans. And those same sort of blooms that can harm coral end up harming these organisms too. Because that's when we talked earlier about clean sand versus mm -hmm. a little bit dirty sand. Mm -hmm. That's part of what makes it dirty. And so you can imagine all of these animals' homes between the sand grains are now being taken up by something new. So what then could we do? Because we, we all want to protect the coral, but now we've just found out there's a whole other universe down there between our toes, under our feet, on the beach, that we also want to protect. So what advice would you give to any young people who are watching who really want to try and make a difference um, in general to save you know, the marine habitat, but particularly our beautiful uh, sand creatures? So one thing that we definitely see is the impact of plastics uh, on the ocean. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things that we've run across is this idea of microplastics. Mm -hmm. So when plastics get out into the water, they can actually get broken up and broken up and broken up into tiny and tinier and tinier pieces. We actually have seen some of those in our samples. Cool. So you can imagine for an animal that's making its living between these sand grains, imagine one of those little tiny things accidentally eating a piece of plastic instead of a piece of food. And we've seen that at a larger scale with, with fish and birds mm -hmm. and dolphins and whales and so on in plastic, even these little creatures, because the plastic breaks down so small, it's then bite-sized for even the smallest little creatures. And that's obviously going to affect them quite severely. Yeah. So anything we can do to reduce plastics is going to also help to protect this mm -hmm. wonderful universe. Well, thank you so much, Kevin and Rebecca, for introducing us to a whole new world. If somebody wants to find out more, where could they go to have a look at some of these things? So the general term for these microscopic animals that live in grains of sand is myofauna, and just googling myofauna will myofauna. show you the entire plethora of all these different groups of animals. And that's M E I O. Yep, M E I O fauna. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Google that, and you're going to have a great weekend googling all of these <laughs> things and seeing the cute and the bizarre and the weird and wonderful, and it's just a whole world. So thank you so much for telling us all about sand, convincing us, converting us. You've got me <laughs> converted for sure. I now am going to go get my microscope and have a look and see what I can find. Thank you so much for joining us and see you again soon in the next session of Coral Life here from Curacao. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.